to Jesus Christ. Today we have what I find to be a very interesting combination of epistle and gospel. Um, the church lectionary is put together for many reason, reasons and the combination of epistle and gospel reading can often tell us things that neither particular reading tells us on its own and I think today is a little bit of one of those cases. When we start with the epistle we start with what appears to be praise. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. But that's not at all the beginning of praise. It's in fact the beginning of a rebuke. A rebuke from Paul to the Jews who continued to follow the law. He praises, in a sense, their zeal for God, but warns that it is zeal not according to knowledge, and that they follow the law to establish their own righteousness. But Paul contrasts that with righteousness through faith. And he says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, it might be tempting to read this in isolation and understand it to mean that all one needs to do to be saved is believe in your heart, in Jesus, and confess him with your mouth. And th this is often what we hear from those who advocate sola fide, saved by faith alone. Of course, we are saved by faith. But if, if this is the sum total, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you're done, we're going to have some problems. Now, of course, we know as Orthodox Christians that our salvation is an ongoing process. Yes, we have to have faith. Yes, we have to confess Christ with our mouth, but we also have to endure. And we have to show forth the fruits of our faith as we see in the parable of the last judgment. The sheep are those who did certain things. They fed the hungry man, they clothed the naked man, they visited the sick, they visited the captive, and the goats who failed to do those things. But if we take this one reading, and particularly if we take it with sort of a faith alone context, and we put it over the gospel, all of a sudden we see the danger of just trying to take one verse out of context and make a universal rule, rule much less a rule about salvation from isolated verses. Because when we come to the gospel, we have Matthew's account of the Gergesene demoniac. And it's a fairly well-known account. Jesus cast the demons out of these men, two men in, in Matthew's account. The demons flee into the pigs. The pigs run into the lake, and they drown themselves. And the townspeople are more upset with what happened to their livestock than the miraculous uh, healing, and they tell Jesus, leave, leave, go, leave our city. And last year we sort of talked about that, uh, that during this gospel reading. But today, I want to focus a little bit on the beginning of that account when Jesus first encounters the demoniacs. And we read, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now, take note that the demons recognize Christ. And the demons confess Christ with their mouth to be the Son of God. 
that's something that at this point in his ministry, even his disciples didn't recognize or didn't fully grasp or understand the nature, the full nature of Christ's divinity. In addition, we see that these demons also appear to truly believe this in their hearts because they ask him, did you come to torment us before the time? They know there's a coming judgment and they know what's awaiting the demons. So as this account begins, we have the demons believing in Christ and confessing him with their mouths. Can we conclude then that they're going to be saved? Well, if we take one little verse from the epistle and read it in isolation, well, it seems we've met all the legalistic requirements. Belief, confession. But we know it takes more. As it's written in James, Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You see, brothers and sisters, the Jews followed the law, thinking the law would make them righteous. And today many proclaim their belief in Christ, thinking that that by itself will save them. But it can no more save than it would have saved the demons in this account. The, epistles tell, the epistle tells us that we must believe unto righteousness. It's not simply that we believe and are made righteous, but we must believe unto righteousness. When Clement of Alexandria speaks of this verse, he relates it to the philosophical writings on virtue, toil, labor, and reward. For believing unto righteousness is more than just believing, it's a belief that actually bears fruit. Luke tells us in his gospel, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. You see, belief by itself gets us nothing. It's the fruits of that belief that mean everything. The fruits of our belief is what tests and tries and confirms our faith. So brothers and sisters, as we return to this liturgy, let us of course believe and confess Christ, the Son of the living God, as our Lord and Savior. But let us also receive the precious gifts of grace prepared for us by him, that our souls may be nourished in the good fruits of our repentance brought to bear. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God.